Lee Waters is uh, with us. He's going to be our uh, person providing the, in, uh, the crop insurance uh, presentation today. He is the vice president of crop insurance uh, in Muhammad and has been with Farm Credit Illinois for 14 years. And yeah. despite working around Rob Stoll, you still look young. Yeah, I somehow made that work out. So, and in 14 years, you know, I always joke, crop insurance agents and anybody in this industry, something new and different every year, it always changes. So we'll go ahead and get going here. Uh, what's new in 22? So new things coming in crop insurance. The main thing uh, that we're gonna talk about today is, at the beginning is the PACE endorsement. Um, don't know everything about it yet, but this is basically the option that they've came out. Illinois Corn Growers is really behind this. This is a buy-up product that allows you to protect you from if you cannot apply your second round of side dress nitrogen. Um, there's been some stuff in the news before that some people were thinking it was going to be a discount. If you did, that's not the case. This is going to be an extra buy-up. Basically, what's going to happen um, is it's going to be a policy along with your RP that if you cannot get your nitrogen applied between V3 and V10 due to wet weather, that will have a bushel coverage on the side. So keep in mind, that is if you cannot get it applied due to wet weather, not if you can't get the pneumonia or the 28 at all. So what I'm telling people is stay tuned. We don't really have, we have some ideas on rates, but this will be an additional purchase with your coverage. So I bet in a week, the industry, including myself, other agents, we're gonna know a lot more about it, whether it's something you will want to look at or not. Um, these are the counties that are going to qualify for PACE endorsement, basically Champaign North. Um, Southern Illinois is not going to be in this program, but my, my territory will. So we'll have some information on that at renewal time um, and be able to make you know, some decisions around that. Um, the only other changes really probably won't apply to the room too much. There is some changes on organic practices, um, basically saying that you got to have uh, your organic plan certified by acreage reporting date. Um, also, transitional acres are required to have a plan. Um, same thing, if you've got some organic stuff and you need some more information, um, we'll be happy to dig into that a little bit deeper. A um, little bit on whole farm revenue policy. This mostly applies to um, farmers that have several crops, especially getting into like greenhouses, vegetables, things like that. It's a revenue coverage program. Um, doesn't really fit to central Illinois with a corn bean grower, um, but <clears throat> same thing. If there's a person out there that needs to look into this further, we do have the information on it. They did make a new thing about micro farm policies. What this is, this is for same thing. So say somebody's got a uh, food stand or, or they do a farmer's market stuff, lower income type stuff, they have the ability to do some coverages. So um, key reminders, start out with plant dates. So these dates apply to if you plant before these days, you lose your replant coverage. That's it. Corn. April 5th, beans, we'll get to that in a minute, but corn is April 5th and June is the final plant date. As you go south, that goes lower. Soybeans, um, the far right corner there is still April 20th. As you go south, that turns to April 15th. FAC means following another crop, also known as double crop beans. In this immediate territory, those are not insurable, so that won't apply here. But as you basically get south of I-70, they are allowed to insure double crop beans. In this area, we're not. So speaking into the final plant dates, um, one thing I want to talk about is the ability to purchase additional replant riders. So as I said, your corn policy, federal crop, April 5th, soybeans, April 20th. So many companies out there have additional replant riders you can purchase in junction, usually with an additional hail policy. What those basically do is two things. Um, you can increase the dollars of coverage you have and then also, many of them will lower or will uh, make the plant date earlier. Um, one that we sell quite a bit of in this territory, it's very popular. April 20th, obviously, is our plant date. We have people planting beans a lot earlier than that. Um, the companies right now offer usually 14 to 20 days earlier than the April 20th. So, say you want to plant beans on the 10th of April, that additional rider would provide you replant coverage because your federal crop policy wouldn't. But also, not just for the early planting, but just for replant in general, um, most of these riders are fairly inexpensive uh, for the value you get for them. One I want to show here is just a quick example. Um, this is somebody who's got 100 acres of soybeans, and it's on a 50-50 farm. So that means it's like, say it's your mother, and you 50-50 lease it. Your federal crop covers replant on your part. 
That's it, not her part. So let's say uh, the federal crop has a replant. They're going to pay you about $39 an acre this year. The riders, in this example, this person's bought a replant rider that adds $75 of coverage, and actually it applies to your share and your mother's share both. Uh, many of the riders out there allowed you to do that. So when you go and replant that 100 acres, you're going to get the uh, $1,950 on the federal crop replant, but then your rider's going to pay you an additional $7,500. Um, we had a lot of these claims two years ago with a lot of the replant um, for what it costs. Um, it's, I think, very important to add these to your policy. Um, yeah, many of you do get typically reduced or free seed, but just the idea of having to go out and, re and do, the, do it over again, especially on corn. And I think corn's been the bigger one to have this on than soybeans because, for instance, two years ago, we had a 200-acre farm we ripped up. Having that rider made us a lot more uh, comfortable to just go ahead and proceed with that and tear that corn up and redo it because with the stand that we had, it wasn't going to produce the yield we wanted. Ripped it up, planted it on June 4th, had a pretty good crop, but the replant endorsement threw in, you know, between the 75 plus our federal crop, another 100 bucks and change. It made that decision a lot easier to make. Um, just remember, and I stress this to all my clients, all of you know I send a lot of texts and reminders. If you're, if you're in a replant situation, if you're even considering replanting, you have to call me and put the claim in, and you have to talk to an adjuster before you do it. 99% of the time, the adjuster is going to tell you over the phone, go ahead and start. Or if it's, and if it's under, uh, was 100 acres or 200 acres, I can't remember what this year it's going to be. Sherry, do you have that number? It's 100 acres is what they call self-certification per unit. So if it's under 100 acres, the adjuster, you're going to talk to them on the phone, they're going to say, go ahead. If it's over 100 acres, they're going to need to look at it. Depending on the situation, if you're spotting stuff in, they're probably still going to tell you, go ahead, I'll come take a picture when I get to. I rarely have situations. They're not really taking an agronomist approach as much. They just need to be told because they have to be able to debate the claim later. So um, just remember, even if it's on a Friday, if you're considering it and it's the heat of replant season, please put the claim in. I'm going to send texts out to remind you to do it. But we can't pay those if you did it and then turn the claim in afterwards. So just want to stress that. We don't want to miss out on any payments. Preventive planting. We were kind of hoping we'd forget about this after a few years ago, but um, just a quick, quick, uh, couple quick changes to prevent plant. Uh, you'll notice up here in the top left, the one in four rule, this came into effect, basically says that if you have a farm, it has to be planted, insured, and harvested one of the last four years in order to qualify for prevent plant. This, is, uh, this came into effect in the Dakota areas. Um, where they were making some rule changes from guys that were basically prevent planting farms multiple years in a row. So just keep this in mind. I hope we don't run into this, but there's some situations, say you uh, rent an 80-acre farm from somebody and it wasn't insured the last four years by the prior tenant. That is not going to qualify prevent plant this year. There's some unique situations where that can come into play. So just keep that in the back of your mind if that ever happens. Um, at renewal season, we're going to walk through this, but when I meet with my clients, we ask, you know, are you adding any land, taking any land off, so on and so forth. Those may be some questions we want to think about when that time comes. Um, same thing with prevent plant. Timely notice loss has to happen. We can't file it in September. And, oh, yeah, by the way, I didn't get this 80 planted. Um, it's got to be due to insured loss in 2019. That was wet weather during the planting season, basically. June, on corn, June 5th is the final plant date. If you cannot plant by June 5th, and there is a cause of loss, you are eligible to consider prevent plant. And what I always tell people, and we walked through this two, a couple years ago, but when you have prevent plant, you do have choices. You need to be prepared for those choices when that time comes. If we get in that situation again, remember, once June 5th gets here and you haven't planted, you could still plant corn if you like. It's not a problem. You're just going to lose 1% of your coverage per day at your late up to June 30th. I'm sorry, June 25th. Um, you could also um, open the prevent plant claim, and if you leave it idle, that means you don't plant it at all, you get 100% of that payment. The third option is, and usually in our area is not the one to look at, is to plant another crop after the final plant date. So that means you prevent corn on June 5th, we get past the plant date, and you decide to put beans out. If you do that, you're going to get 35% of that claim, and you're going to pay 35% of the premium but you're also going to receive a ding on your APH on the corn. 
if you leave it idle, it's like the crop was never planted basically. So anyways, just want to make sure if we get into that again, just be open to your options and I hope we don't run into it, but you never know, it could happen. So also you can consider right now prevent plant, you get 55% of your guarantee on corn, 60% of your guarantee on beans. You do have an option to buy up 5% if you wish. It is fairly inexpensive in our area, so that's something we can look at renewal season. Expectations for 22. <clears throat> so this really leads good off of uh, Matt's earlier pre presentation. Um, two main factors affecting crop insurance premiums is market price, obviously, but a big one, a huge one, is implied volatility of your market. So um, a lot of you don't really you know, we don't get into that too much, but there's a volatility factor for your, on your uh, premiums that is basically set by the RMA also, and it's tracked the last five days of February. In a nutshell, the more volatile the markets are, the more higher that implied volatility is. So where we're at right now compared to last year, um, very similar volatility levels. Um, corn right now compared to last year at this time is almost identical. Last year, once we went through February, it climbed a couple more points. Beans were pretty decently amount lower than beans, but beans made a huge rise. But what I want to drive home with that is volatility is not a bad thing. Yes, it will make the premiums a little higher, but if you price options on the market, it's the same exact thing. More volatility is basically uh, going to give you more opportunities for pricing. We also went from record low volatility in prices not that many years ago. And a lot of you, you know, noticed last year, we went from 2020 to 2021, we had quite a jump in premium cost. That was due to having a lot better price, but also we went from record low volatility to the same volatility we had in 2012, not that long ago. So keep that in mind. Um, here's a couple examples. These are basic, just showing you here what our guarantees are going to be looking like for 22. Um, this is a customer, I used a 215 APH, but last year we had a 458 spring price, which was really good. We haven't had a $4.58 spring price in a long time. Um, with math last year, you were guaranteeing 837 bucks per acre with an 85% policy. This year, you see I got plus or minus 550. So we need, the price is set during February on the DS 22 board. So let's say it comes in at 550. Now we're guaranteeing over a thousand bucks an acre with our 85% policy, $168 more of coverage than the year before. Beans, very similar story. Um, we're looking at probably another 60 bucks plus or minus. It'll be interesting to see what this looks like after the report, but keep in mind this will happen in February. So um, I expect better coverage than last year. For premiums, I expect it's gonna really depend on volatility. For right now, what I'm telling my clients is it could be even to maybe up 20%, depending on where all these numbers come in. So for instance, last year, 85 enterprise customer in Champaign County price spent about 30 bucks. This year, if we keep our volatility where we're at and prices up, it may be close to that 30-ish dollars, but if it keeps going up a little more, you may see it go to 35, maybe 40. But right now, for instance, that 30 to 40 range is gonna catch probably a lot of the premiums on that 85 enterprise policy for right now, depending on where we end up. And what I always tell people when you're trying to make decisions on this, you have five to 10 bucks, depending on where we end up, is, could be a decision factor, but your difference between 85 and 80 is gonna be the same ratio, no matter if that's a $30 premium or a $40 premium. If, 80, if 85 is 30 bucks, 80 is gonna be 15. If 85 is 40 bucks, 80 is gonna be 20. That's just where it's gonna be. So that's where some of the options are. And of course, we're not talking about option units or anything, but that just gives you a rough idea of where we currently are sitting for now. And we'll know a lot more as we get approach February. Sherry did a good job on this. Sherry Tom Have over here is one of our training coordinators when we put this together. We wanted to drive home. We call it the top five crop rules of engagement. As you know, you see me more than once per year, correct? I don't just sell you the policy and say, see ya, we'll see you in a year. You see your agents multiple times a year. There's a little bit of activity that involves maintaining your crop insurance policy right now, before we start in the renewal season, is reporting your production. And one thing I want to stress with people is when you're reporting your production to us, you're starting to notice the last couple years we're asking you how you came up with that number. Is that a delivery sheet? 
was this in a bin? If it is in a bin, is it a 10,000 bushel bin just because you know that's a 10,000 bushel bin? Or is this your weigh scale tickets from your auger wagon? Or is this from your combine monitor? The reason we need to know that is we need to know the type of record you're using to report your production. Just to show you here, the difference between soft and hard records. A hard record is kind of like what's the set in stone final number. That's like what you sold at the elevator. What an adjuster measured in a bin, so on and so forth. A soft record is what supports those records, the hard records. That's the combine monitor. That's the bin measurements you did on your own. That's the 10,000 bushel bin's always been 10,000 bushel bin. At the end of the day, when you report your production, you can report soft or hard records. The reason we need to know that is if you ever have an audit, they're gonna go back and wanna see what you used to support it. If your yield monitor is a few bushel off, as long as you use that consistently, you're fine. But the main thing is keep all that stuff consistent and keep it somewhere where you can find it. So if you report every year with your auger wagon records, keep them with your stuff. So if we ever gotta pull them back up, we got them. And that's why we're asked, we're looking out for you. Because if you uh, can't support those records, there are some APH penalties that could happen in an audit. We hope it doesn't. But that's why we're kind of grilling you guys a little bit when we're going through these yields. We wanna make sure everything's right. We wanna make sure everything's correct. Acreage reporting. Um, Basically, this is just the most important thing is when you report acres to us is that the right crops are on the right farms. We can't have a situation where, uh, hey, this field was beans, but it was said, said it was corn and vice versa. Um, when you have a claim, that could be a situation. So accuracy of your acreage reporting is important. Um, you know, we, we do several things when we report acres. We either go off your 578s. If you notice, we do like to review that with you. Those are a third party record, but they can be wrong sometimes. And that being wrong is not an excuse for your crop policy being wrong. So that's why we sit there with you and we review fields. When we look at the pictures of the farms, is this corn, is this beans, has anything changed, are the shares correct? That stuff's very important um, when we get to a claim. Um, do remind you that crop acres planted versus FSA acres, what you report to me is what's set in stone. There's usually not too many situations though why you should be different than the FSA office. There's a few situations that could happen, but um, you know we wanna work with them. They have situations too with payments that could come sometimes. You want things to be accurate. So the best thing to do is to make sure you're, you know, would spend the time, go through the farms, make sure everything's reported in the correct manner. So, crop hail and wind coverage. Um, you know, we've talked about multi peril crop insurance quite a bit. Your RP 85% is kind of your base policy. Um, crop hail, I'm a huge believer in crop hail insurance. Um, crop hail in central Illinois is fairly inexpensive for what you can buy. And it does provide things beyond hail. You get stored grain coverage, you get fire. Fire's huge. If my combine catches my field on fire, my crop hail insurance is my only coverage on that crop. My farm liability does not cover my corn in the field when I catch it on fire. Now, if I catch my neighbor's field or my neighbor catches my field on fire, their farm liability comes into play. But if you burn an 80 of corn up with your combine, your crop hail is, that's it. That's what's gonna pay. So for two, three bucks an acre on corn hail, I like having corn hail on it because you never know, besides hail coverage. Um, we're in an area that a couple years ago, we had a once in a hundred year hail event also. Um, a lot of hail damage from Urbana down to Philo. Um, hail, hail coverage is nice, especially if you're an enterprise unit customer, which we'll walk to in a minute. Enterprise units, when you have all your farms in one guarantee, let's say your 80 north of town gets destroyed by hail and everything else makes 240 bushel. There is a possibility you may not have a federal crop claim because all of your other corn offset the yield from that. Hail goes down to the farm level. So I'm a, big, I'm, I'm a big proponent of having hail insurance in conjunction with it. There are other um, types of endorsements you can add. Um, hail around here is pretty standard. Uh, wind, green snap, extra harvest expense coverage is uh, becoming more and more looked at uh, depending on what part of the county you're in. Just remember to understand that every company is very similar um, how they adjust green snap, how they adjust the wind, how they adjust the extra harvest expense, but every company's got a little bit different deductible plans. We don't sell a lot of deductibles on the hail itself. The deductibles typically come into play on your wind and your green snap. 
Um, there are zero deductibles. There's 5% flat deductibles. There's disappearing deductibles, so on and so forth. Um, the higher deductible, the lower your premium is, but you do have to hit your deductible level on some of these claims. So depending on what you're wanting to accomplish with your, your wind policy, you need to take that into consideration when doing that. There's a variety of them, um, but every company has a little bit different plans with that. So um, let's see. Renewal time, which we're getting ready to get into. Main thing with the renewal time is making sure that we understand if anything's changed on your farm. And some of those questions are if you've added a farm, if you added land, um, have you entered a county with high risk? But some things are as basic as have you got married or divorced? That's one question we gotta know. If you are a spouse of policy, spouse has to be listed. Are you changing entity type? Some of you may, uh, let's say you form an LLC for 2022, Lee Waters LLC. The policy has to be set up how you're selling the grain. Not necessarily, if you're using an LLC to own your equipment, it's different, but if you're selling the grain as an LLC, the policy has to be an LLC or a corporation or a partnership, however you do it. So remember to be open with your agent about any changes like that. We need to know about it. We're gonna be asking about it, but it's important for all that to be on there. Um, main things here too, um, and this really leads off what uh, Matt was talking about too, is as you approach renewal season and talking about your coverage levels knowing your break-even cost. Everyone in here is gonna have a different break-even cost and that's completely fine. Some of you may have more rented ground, some of you may owe the ground and you're paying for it, some of you may have a lot of 50-50 and that's fine, but your federal crop, if you know that number earlier, that $1,000 number, there's gonna be some people bumping up against that pretty close, depending on the situation and just knowing where you're at and if you have a claim, you know where your protection's gonna be. And forward marketing, if you're gonna be putting an offer out there today, as soon as you're done, you run out there with five minutes to go for the report and call the elevator. If you're selling grain ahead, federal crop is extremely important to have. It is giving you a bushel guarantee to protect you from. At 85%, a 200 bushel APH customer is guaranteed 170 bushel an acre. That, no matter what happens, if it's a, from a peril of cause loss, that 170 bushel guarantee is set. If you're a 215 bushel APH, 183. If you're a 235 APH, 200 bushel an acre. No matter what, you've got a floor put in place that if you would like to sell ahead, you do have some coverage in case you don't have the bushels. And also, and we'll get into that a little bit, but having the harvest price option, which is included, is critical if you're selling ahead also. And we'll walk through that in a little bit. And the big one, this is the one I'm getting calls about, and it's okay, because I enjoy this, is choosing your 22 coverage and your farm program election. ARC or PLC. Everybody's calling up, Lee, ARC versus PLC. Which one am I doing? Two years ago, in 2019, going into 2020, our approach was, which one's gonna pay? And we knew which one was gonna pay, because when the government came out with the new farm program, it took them two years to get established, and we were able to pick the farm program in 20 after we were done harvesting already and we kind of had a pretty good idea what was going to happen. That was a one-time deal. So those of you that were uh, doing ARC individual on some farms here and there up north, northern part of the county especially, or uh, we did ARC County Beans and PLC Corn. We were doing that because we knew ARC County Beans a few years ago was going to pay. And it was because Champaign County had lower yields and the national price was below average. Uh, ARC Individual was a one-time one deal we did that use your own yields instead of the county. And we did that because we knew what our own yields were already. Now, going into this year, we no longer have the look back option. We're now picking going ahead. Um, basically, at the end of the day, the main decision is this. ARC County and PLC both on their own are probably not gonna be a big factor in the protection this year. And the biggest reason is, is they are based on, heavily on national average price. Both of them have a, about a 370 range, or PLC has a 370 floor, and our county's using that same price for its county guarantee, and I'm gonna walk through that in a little bit. But when you have a five and six on corn, and it's based on national average price, we're much above those levels right now. So, here's what it comes down to. It's called supplemental coverage option from now on called SCO. You're gonna hear me talk about SCO a lot today. To buy SCO coverage, which takes you from 86% down to your underlying coverage level, you have to be in the PLC program. So if you're not taking SCO, 
doesn't matter. You'll probably lean Art County, and I'll discuss that. SEO candidates out there is if you're not buying 85%. So if you have 85%, my opinion, I don't think it's worth messing with to go from 85 to 86%. But if you're not buying 85, it's something to consider looking at. It's a county-based program, but it fills in the difference between 86 down to you. So where are my people that are doing that are ones that are buying 80 or less, or if you're an 85 person who may consider lowering their underlying coverage and adding SEO back for a premium savings. The advantage, premium savings. The disadvantage, SEO is county-based. Underlying coverage is personal. There is a chance you could have a claim, county not, or vice versa. So we'll walk through that in a little bit. So if you're not taking SEO, we're probably leaning towards Art County because PLC is a price program. I'm gonna walk through it in a minute. Art County is yield and price. So we'll walk through that right now. Just remember that they do allow you to make these changes yearly. So we are picking the 22 program right now. So PLC pays if every farm in the United States averages under 370 corn for 22. Probably not gonna happen. I hope it doesn't happen. If we've already sold some five dollar corn, that's going into that fact. It's a national rolling average. 22, 21, definitely no payments. 22, we're, we're much above that. Our county is a county revenue program that uses national average price, county yield at an 86% level. 21 crop, high yields, high prices, no payments. 22 crop, the revenue guarantees that our county provide you are probably not going to be in the levels that we're currently in. And I'll walk through that in a little bit. But right now, if you're not caring about SEO, if you had to pick one of the two, our county's probably how you would go if you're not buying the SEO program. Now, just a reminder again, they use five-year rolling average on our county. It's based on, this is based on price and yield. This one's price only. As I said, national average price. So as we walk into that, these, these programs I'm talking about, SCO is a, a county-based program. There's two different types of above coverage that you can purchase that are based on county. The first one over here is SCO again. I'm going to walk through it first and hit ECO next. Supplemental coverage option as I said, takes you from 86% down to whatever you purchase. So if you have 75% coverage, this would take you 75 to 86, all based on county numbers. Enhanced coverage option goes further. This was new last year, 86 to 95%. Those are also based on county numbers. So just to let you know here, the county has to trigger the claim. The dollars of coverage you have is actually based on your farm. To put that in a nutshell, farmer A has a 200 bushel APH. Farmer B has a 240. Both pay at the same time, but farmer B with the higher APH gets a little more money than farmer A, but he also paid more for it. You got more dollars. They're basing the, they're basing the total dollars of, get, of money on your historical, but it pays when the county has a loss. The county yield is determined by the RMA. It is always June the following year. So for instance, the 21 corn crop, we'll know the final county yield in June of 22. They're waiting for all of you to report your yields to your agents. That all gets compiled at the RMA level and they come up with a county number. It's pretty accurate. Um, for instance, for 2021, I believe 215 to 220 is gonna catch Champaign County. Just my opinion for what I've seen so far. There's, there's above and below that, but that's probably gonna be pretty close. So this is just a picture. I'm a picture guy. This is just your three steps when you're sitting with your agent this year. Step one, your revenue protection is where you always start. That is based on your farm. That is based on your APH. The claims are based on your performance. This just shows three different options, 85, 80, and 75. So your levels are there. Unit structure, enterprise versus optional. Enterprise is all your farms are considered one unit. Optional units is when every farm and section share has its, it's got its own guarantee. So that's where you start. No matter what you do on the rest, start there. Then step two, considering if you're going to buy SCO or not. So as you see over here, I don't have SCO on my 85% guy. There's no point in having it. But if you're less, it's something to consider. It's taking you county-based coverage right here. 
have to be PLC at the FSA on that crop to do that on that farm number. Step three, if you want to consider, is enhanced coverage option. ECO does not matter on what farm program you're in. Only the green box. That's all that matters on the PLC ARC decision. The rest of it does not account for it. So the reason I'm talking about SCO is this. If you're 85, doesn't matter. But if you're not 85, SCO provides a much better county level trigger guarantee than the ARC County program does, and this is why. This shows you right here, a lot of math here, but at the end of the day, this is Champaign County. What ARC County's doing, and ARC County's a farm program, not a coverage. ARC County's giving you a $706 guarantee. It's based on 222 times the benchmark price of 370 and times 86%. So this just shows you two quick examples. The final revenue for your county is based on the county yield and the market average price. So if we have 525 corn average for next year, which I think is very possible, Champaign County's gotta be under 135 bushel an acre to trigger an ARC County payment. At 450 corn, 157 bushel per acre. The higher the price goes, the lower the yield has to be. The lower the price goes, the yield gets to be higher. As I said, farm program. This shows SCO coupled with PLC. So the reason I'm showing you this is if you're not 85, this is something to consider. SCO uses the spring and fall price system like your federal crop does, because it's a federal crop policy. So this shows what you're doing with SCO. It's using 215, that's the county expected yield, and I used a 550 spring price times 86%. You're looking at a $1,000 19 trigger. So it's got, almost got a $300 head start on it on our county. Very big difference. You are paying for SCO. You're not paying for our county, but it's something to look at. At 550 corn or higher, it doesn't matter. It's got 185 bushel county trigger. The higher the price goes, it's got harvest price option. When price goes down, county drops. So right here at 450, you're looking at a 226 trigger. This is a big reason I'm talking about this. If you're not at the high level on your underlying is which I'd like people to try to lock in as many dollars of coverage as they can, whether it's on their own or using a county combination because this could happen. 450 corn, I mean, sounded good a few years ago. 450 corn be kind of rough this year if you don't have the yield. And at least you're, you're either protecting it on your 85 level or you're protecting it with a combination of your two. So as I said, remember it's an area plan uses county numbers. If you're RP, 80, enterprise, or lower, and keyword two here is enterprise. Optional people, I'm not as big a fan of it because you're spending your dollars on keeping your fields separate at 80 or 85. You're probably gonna put those dollars there, but if you're an enterprise person on corn, especially, you can save money if you want to by going 85 to 80, but 85 is still your best coverage. Lowering, you could consider it. This is just what it looks like. Here's an 85 customer here on the left. Here's somebody who took 80. Here's an 80 with SCO. So you can see what they're doing here. These two policies act the same on the bottom. They're both 80% U. All I did was tack on that county base level protection on top. This is a 75% customer. This is 75 adding SCO on top. Enhanced coverage option works very similar again to SCO but it goes higher based on county numbers also. Same thing, does not matter on your under, uh, if you're part ARC or PLC. But if you're using ECO this year, these are some of the numbers we're starting to look at. At $1,125 county guarantee. At 550 corner higher, if Champaign County is under 205, it could trigger a claim at that price. At 450 corn, all of a sudden 250 bushel corn in Champaign County triggers a revenue loss. 236 is the highest yield we've ever had in this county, just to give you a little bit of a reference. So if we had a monster corn crop and something happened, you know, if we had a price drop, ECO could be very valuable. It will cost you, but it gives you, what you're doing is you're buying up dollars of guarantee. This is how ECO looks coupled with policy. So this is an 85% coverage person and they additionally purchased ECO. This is interesting here. This person bought 80%, decided, you know what? I don't need SCO. I'm just gonna dump my dollars directly into the ECO program itself. You don't have to have them together. So it's kind of unique. This is somebody, this is what I did last year. I bought this, 
coupled this with it, and then coupled that. So I was covering from 80 to 95 on county, and 80 and under was personal. And there's also a very different variety of options. One thing to consider on ECO is you do have the ability to buy premium down. This is my best way of explaining it to clients is this. Right here, this person paid 100% of the ECO premium, and they get 100% of the claim if it's paid. Over here on the right, you do have the ability to buy it down to 50%. So basically, I just shaded half this box out. This customer is paying, buying their RP85. They decided, listen, I want 95% coverage still, but I'm going to give you 50 cents on a dollar for the coverage. You're going to pay me 50 cents on a dollar for a claim. Another way to look at it, it's, like, it's kind of like taking it on half your acres. This was pretty popular last year with my few people that did do this. They did, some people did this. I had a few people that are like, you know what, I want that trigger, but I'm going to lower my dollars. So I can spend less, but still have some coverage in place. So just to give you an idea, these are some ranges. Like I told you that earlier, like last year, what I had some people doing, RP85 Enterprise was 30 bucks. Last year, this year, 30 to 40. 80 last year was probably 15. This year, 15 to 20. So what some people did is they're like, you know what, instead of spending 30, they jumped over here, spent 15 and seven for 22. So if you're, if you're doing this for the purpose of buying down premium, if you're going to go from 85 to 80 and you're trying to reduce premium, I highly recommend coupling it. Or if you're just not doing it anyway. This is probably still the number one option. And also keep in mind, county-based coverage. If you're in certain parts of Champaign County that maybe have more losses than others, you probably should not do SCO. Um, north of 136, just to be a perfect example. My clients up there, I'm probably not recommending doing that. They're going to trigger claims more often if they're 85 more times out of 10 years than, say, if you're from Philo. It's just, it's just how it works. So if you're in a better part of the county with less loss, losses over 10 years, it's something to consider. So we'll look at that one at renewal time. Every farm's different. And that's why when you have one neighbor doing PLC and another neighbor doing Art County, it's fine. It's, it has to do with this coverage. That's it. It's not because neighbor A knows Art County's paying and PLC's not. It's all going to come down to your coverage that you're purchasing. Okay, um, driving this home again, as I said, all that farm decision comes down to is if you're purchasing SCO or not. In my opinion, this is Lee Waters' opinion, if you're not buying SCO, you'll probably do Art County. If you are going to buy SCO, you'll do PLC. SCO will be most popular on corn because it does save you some if you buy down. Beans, I've looked at some premiums. I'm not as big a fan of it on beans. It doesn't save enough to not have your high coverage in place, but you'll, we'll look at it. So, so when you're having those conversations with FSA, and if you've already enrolled, and I know some of the county around here have been asking you to get it done, it could be changed by March 15th. March 15th is the deadline for farm program. March 15th is the, program, or is the deadline for your crop insurance. There's a reason they're the same. It's because they're related. Um, any other questions? I don't want to be up here too much longer. I appreciate everybody's time. So. Let's start. <clears throat>